back. We're live. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Movies We Can Learn. And we're going to review Hell in the Pacific, made in 1968. And uh, what can we learn uh, from these two enemies in this movie? Um, with Shackley Ruffero, uh, a captain in the U.S. Navy uh, and uh, Reserve, is it? And um, Michael Lilly, a captain in the U.S. Navy non reserve. And uh, Shackley is um, uh, a, the retired judge, Second Circuit, chief judge of the Second Circuit. And uh, Michael Lilly is a uh, former, uh, uh, former attorney general of the state of Hawaii. So, Shackley, uh, this is a very interesting movie, I must say. And you guys are well qualified to talk about it. It's during World War II. It involves a, a downed uh, American pilot. Um, uh, played by uh, Lee Marvin. Lee Marvin, and um, it's also uh, a, uh, I guess a, 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 a fellow who was um, in the a Japanese army. His name, his name is revealed as Tsuruhiko Kuroda, and he's played by Toshiro Mifune, which is one of my favorite Japanese actors. But uh, Shackley, can you give us a, kind of an introduction on what this movie is about and why it is significant? Um, I'd be happy to. Uh, title again is Hell in the Pacific, and it was um, created in 1968 uh, by director John Borman, an Englishman who's done, who's done quite a few really good movies. As you mentioned, it stars two people, Lee Marvin and Toshiro Mifune. And they are they are both um, military officers. Uh, Marvin is an American Navy officer, ostensibly uh, bailed out of an aircraft in the South Pacific, and Mifune is is a Japanese uh, uh, officer. And they end up uh, marooned together, alone, uh, on a small island in the South Pacific during uh, the Pacific uh, part of the uh, war, of World War II. Um, I was going to say, uh, Lee Mar. It's interesting because this was this movie was done about twenty years after the end of World War II. Lee Marvin was actually a combat marine. He served uh, during some of the big battles uh, with the Marines, and World War II was was uh, wounded on Saipan. And uh, Toshiro Mifune also served in the Japanese military during World War II, so he had real people in a sense. Uh, playing the the roles that they play on on the screen, so they kind of bring that background uh, with them to the to the performances, which I I think makes it extra interesting because it's it must have had some brought a lot home you know for both of them while they were in the process of doing that. Um, it's it's all about how they relate to each other during their period on the island and and when they leave the island. Uh, and they go through different phases. I think it's kind of a metaphor for the evolution of civilization. And I jotted down uh, phases of anger, hostility, mistrust, eventually mutual coexistence, sharing and cooperation, and ultimately differential cultural awareness, and again, mis distrust. Um, it's 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 basically kind of a tragedy in a way. Uh, I think there probably is a Greek play or a Shakespearean tragedy that must have provided the idea to the director. Uh, but it reminded me of this poem that I'd like to read a little bit of, which is one of my favorites. It's, it's by Rudyard Kipling, The Ballad of East and West. And it goes, Oh, east is east and west is west and never the twain shall meet. Till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. But there's neither east nor west, border nor breed nor birth, when two strong men stand face to face, though they come from the ends of the earth. I think it captures exactly what mm -hmm. uh, it does. That's the introduction. I'll, I'll uh, chime in as we go along. Okay. Uh, Mike Lilly, your thoughts about this movie. Why? Why is this movie as um, you know well regarded as it is? It is, it is a gripping war movie. Um, I first saw it. You have to imagine I was off the coast of Vietnam during the war, 
And I saw this movie and I was spellbound about these two towering um, actors. The, Lee Marvin, for those that don't remember these two actors, Lee Marvin is one of the greatest actors in uh, America. And Toshima Mifune was not only the greatest Japanese actor, but he's probably one of the greatest actors of all time. And so they both land on this deserted island, and it's, and it's in the tropical Pacific. That's actually filmed on an island in the Palau's, which is just north of New Guinea. And one of the things that's remarkable is there's no coconut trees. And I always wondered about that because, you know, you think about coconuts and when you think about tropical islands and the director said he he searched the world for that because he didn't want his actors in an island that had a lot of plenty he he wanted them to be out there uh starving uh not enough water um uh, they were they were that they, they had they had a, there was a survival movie as much as a uh, as a war movie, and it was also it was a psychological thriller. A great deal of this movie uh, is almost in pantomime. Uh, the the director originally, John Borman, uh, planned to have a silent film, but then he added dialogue. So you've only got two actors. So you had Toshiro Mufuni speaking Japanese, and Lee Marvin speaking English, and no subtitles. And you don't need to even understand either language to understand what they're saying and what they're uh, trying to do, because it's all done by acting. And these two characters clash, and they imagine this is a microcosm of World War II. The the two uh, Japanese, the Japanese army and the American army are fighting on this little island between these two characters, uh, and they go through a period of fighting each other, but they don't kill each other, which is kind of interesting. They, um, they make, make a lot of noise, and they make it look like they're going to kill each other, but they don't. And at one point, Mifune captures Marvin, and he has him tied up and dragging a rock around the beach, and then Marvin gets free, and then he ties up Mifune, and has him going around. And uh, at some point, they realize that uh, alone they can't survive on this island. And so they're going to have to accommodate each other. But their testosterone is such that it's an uneasy truth. Um, they they almost don't ever really become friends except near the end, and we talk about that in a little bit. But on the island, they pretty much decided they're going to have to cooperate if they're going to survive. And so they ultimately... Uh, get a lot of bamboo and they're able to build a raft and and, and they set out now it, they didn't know where they were going uh it, i didn't see any food or water on that raft but they apparently were on that raft for a while um and they braved the elements and there was lots of uh, towering waves uh, anyway they wind up on another beach and it turns out to be a, a beach with uh, fortifications that look like they've been bombed out and and uh, pretty de uh, decrepit. But they think it's a Japanese-held building. And so Marvin hides while Toshiro Mifune goes up to find the Japanese and, and to, to protect Lee Marvin. Well, Lee Marvin sees a bunch of... Uh, things that are the U.S. Navy or the U.S. Army, and he realizes, oh, no, this isn't Japanese. It's it's American. And so he runs up, don't shoot, don't shoot, don't He's trying to be, protect Mifune. They're trying to protect each other. And and there's a very interesting thing happens. They they don't see each other. Mifune's in the building, and he, and he steps out, and he makes a noise, and Marvin looks up and sees Mifune, and he's startled, and he then he realizes it's me funny, and he says, "I thought you were a Jap." He'd become he had become at that point such a friend that he didn't think of him as an enemy. He didn't think of him as a Jap. He was his friend, and here they were protecting each other. 
So that that's that that is what leads up to um, what happens in the end, which is very dramatic. But but from a cinematography standpoint, the the visuals. Um, they got a nomination in the Academy Awards for Best Costume. Um, the, the only thing on the island other than those two were birds. So you heard them talking and birds, and that was it. And then the island. And then they wound up semi-friends, and that's what takes them up near the end. But uh, and, and it also had an, a, a very unusual... Um, musical score. Um, it was haunting. Sometimes it was opera music, like Phantom of the Opera, but the the, the score was just brilliant. Uh, and this was an extremely difficult film to film. Just imagine they were out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, they were living on a a, a rented uh, ship run by some Chinese. So every day they'd they'd leave the ship to go ashore and they'd have to have all everything had to be battery or uh I don't know how they, they there was no power on that island. I mean it that island is now you can go there now. It's called Lee Marvin Beach. And you can there there are uh, uh trips that will take you out there. You can spend the night on this this pristine beach. Um but getting back to the coconut thing too. I always wondered why they didn't film it on Kauai or or any of the Hawaiian islands, the Kualoa. There, there's plenty of places in Hawaii, but it was the coconuts. He couldn't have coconuts. And they went around, the, yeah, they, they flew around the islands looking for a location, but they settled on Palau. So it's, uh, I, I found it um, a thrilling movie. Uh, I was so captivated when I first saw it in Vietnam that later on when I came home, I, I went and saw it again and then, then saw it recently again. And I, I, I just think it, um, it, ha it came out with a critical acclaim. It, it, uh, the, criti the critics thought it was, a, it was a wonderful movie, so it got really high praise, but it didn't do well in the box office. And... Apparently, the reason was there were some other blockbusters that came out that kind of overshadowed it, uh, and I'll name name a few of those, and you can realize why they were up against a lot of competition. There was The Battle of Britain. There was Where Eagles Dare, which is a wonderful movie. Uh, the Bridge of Remagen, that, that is a magnificent uh, war movie in Germany, and Castle Keep, and there's several others. Um, so unfortunately, it didn't do so well in the box office. But it's such a great movie. It came out in DVD in 2017, and it's all been enhanced. And so, um, if anybody ever wanted to really see a good production of that movie, uh, you can do it in DVD, or you can get it on YouTube. Yeah, it is on YouTube. I saw it on YouTube. Yeah, that's what that <laughs> okay. looks like. Yeah. Would be would be good to see it on the big screen though, because uh, uh, Borman had some uh, nice photography work in that movie, especially the scenes where at sea. Uh, yeah. Reminds me, of course, Akira Kurosawa's kind of uh, films of nature. Uh, one thing I was going to mention was uh, Borman points out. Uh, Mike was kind enough to send me an interview with with the director John Borman. He gave a lot of this background, which was interesting. One of the things he said was that uh, Marvin didn't speak any Japanese and Toshiro Mifune didn't speak any English, and they were all on this boat, right? And uh, but but they became good friends. They were they, apparently they were drinking buddies, and so they would, they would drink together a lot, and uh, and became uh, very good friends during the during the period of the uh, of the filming. And I guess there was a little irritation between the Japan. They had a Japanese crew. Uh, 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 for I guess moving their cameras around and and so on, uh, but a Chinese ship, and I guess it was he, he points out there was a little uh, antagonism there because remember it was very long after World War II, uh, so I guess some feelings were still running hard. But uh, the other thing I mentioned, one thing I noticed during, during the time that they're on the island, um, 
you get to see a contrast between um, uh, uh, the survival efforts of Tashiro Mifune and, and uh, Lee Marvin. Marvin kind of flounders around, uh, especially in the beginning. Uh, uh, he didn't take the survival uh, materials from his life raft, which which Mifune grabs a hold of. And uh, and but then you see Mifune, uh, he uh, he plants a little garden, and he has he he has uh, he he apparently wove a fish trap that he puts out, so he's catching fish, and he's cooking fish on the beach, and then he hangs up. He, he, they, because they're having a kind of uh, adversarial re, uh, interactions, he hangs up some uh, kind of like uh, mobiles that he has created, which are kind. Of, it, it it really captures, I think, kind of the Shinto Buddhist uh, personality of of Mapuni, the way he the way he goes about things. Uh, whereas uh, whereas Marvin is kind of very loud and aggressive and. Uh, and ambles around like kind of like an ape <laughs> sometimes, and is angry. <laughs> you know, you said they they had to collaborate, but uh, I I found the Japanese character much more competent at living alone on a desert island. Yeah, he knew how to fish. He knew how to cook. Uh, he knew how to make weapons to the extent they were useful. Um, he knew how to he knew how to live on a desert island. And I, I, you know, the Lee Marin character really didn't. Uh, he was kind of a klutz, and, <laughs> and you you wonder what he brought to the table. Um, big, bulky guy, and maybe he was. You know what he brought? He brought some kind of creativity. Uh, where Toshiro Mufuni was, uh, he, he was building a little tiny raft just for himself. It was Lee Marvin's idea, and in those moments where he looked up at the birds, there were these seabirds. And it gave him an idea that maybe they could take a raft to another island because seabirds go from island to island or something. And it was his creative idea that led to the large that was more likely to make it. And I'll give you my some of my reactions. Number one is they were in great shape. You know, for guys who were in the in the military in World War II, this is 20 years later, 1968, more than 20 years later, they were in great shape, the two of them. And they look like they went to the gym every day. Uh, <laughs> it's really interesting. Um, and um, you know, the other part of it, I agree with Mike that uh, this was this was brilliant cinematography. Uh, there were scenes that emblazoned themselves on your memory. I mean, for example, when he was covered with mud, you remember that, and only you could only see his eyes. This is the mark eyes. That was extraordinary. It's, it's the kind of thing that that you remember. But I kept thinking of other movies that 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 were close by. For example, Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies, where you're in the state of nature and you're operating at some primeval level. And, you know, all of the culture you brought with you is kind of stripped off. Uh, let's see what you can do alone. In this case, two people. Lord of the Flies was a whole group of kids uh, on a desert island. And so there's this whole human experiment going on, uh, a la Emil Zola, where you, you have a premise that is very unusual, and you see how people adapt to it. Um, you know, there were other movies, too. Uh, for example, and we reviewed this uh, a couple months ago, uh, Woman of the Dunes, a Japanese movie made in the late 40s or early 50s about a guy who slides down and gets involved in a, in a, in a, in a, in a little uh, home in a small town along the coast of Japan, and he can't get out, and there's a woman in there. And it's very, you know, very, it's an art film. And frankly, guys, I thought this was an art film. Um, mm -hmm. It was as much an art film as I can remember seeing it. Well, a war film, because there were no, no military elements here, just these two, these two guys. Um, so I, and I thought that was very interesting. And your point about the music, Mike, you know, I thought the music, was 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 really interesting, but it was jazz. It was jazz, and it was weird jazz, weird jazz, as you could hear anywhere all over Greenwich Village in 1968. That's what the music would have been in 1968. If they're going to remake it, they got to use modern music because this was like weird. <clears throat> but anyway, it was, it's an art film of great interest. And the fact that they never, like Shackley said, they never really got together. They never really became buds. 
um, <clears throat> they understood each other. And it's that east and west, it's that of Rudyard Kipling. Ne never the twain will meet, but maybe the twain understands. And, you know, in 1968, there was an issue about that, trying to understand west to east and east to west, trying to make sense of the war, trying to find a new relationship with Japan. And, you know, all of that was, was in there. And I think there's a lot of important issues that are covered in this very sparse kind of movie. But somebody has to tell me the differential endings, as I don't fully understand, you know, how the endings play with, with the bulk of the movie. The original ending, as I recall, was um, they walked away from each other. Right, your your thing about they they never really found each other. They never really got to be friends. And at the end, in the in the one that Borman made, they just walked away from each other. End of story. But in the uh, the the revised version, which played at a film festival, um, and I can't remember which festival. I think it was in Europe. Um, they had a different ending, and it's the ending which is on YouTube right now. It's uh, where they they get bombed by somebody. I don't know if it was. Uh, a, a Japanese plane or an American plane, and they both die uh, in a shell in a, in a building with, which is destroyed, uh, which is a kind of that's a, that somehow doesn't work as well as the original ending. And as I understand it, Moore was really ticked off that they took his original ending out. Your thoughts? Let, let me set it up though. Um, so they're in this building and they find clothes. They find food, and, and importantly, they find sake. And so they shave themselves, so now they're gentlemen. Uh, and, of course, Mufuni was always the Japanese uh, samurai, and Lee Marvin was always the, the American guy. But, but they're metaphors for, for the two cultures. And they're coming together. They're drinking. They're laughing. They're friends. They're happy. Um, they've survived. They got to this island. They're clean. They're clean shaven. They don't see themselves as enemy. Uh, this is as close to friendship as they ever get. And there's a, uh, an August 16, 1943 magazine, Life magazine, with a Japanese on the cover. And Mifuni is flipping through it. And there's girls and, you know, all the stuff that's American in there. And he happens on four pictures. Only one is in that issue um, uh, of Japanese that are dead, dying, and captured. Um, and the last one is these Japanese that, are di that have died in the mud at the Battle of Tenaru River at the Guadalcanal. But seeing these movies, these pictures, you can see Mufuni's character change from being this friendly guy drinking sake to getting more and more angry, more and more just perturbed by this, and he's staring at this. Meanwhile, uh, Lee Marvin is saying, now tell me why you don't believe in God. They tell me you don't believe in Jesus Christ. What? These guys, they don't understand each other, but he's, he's asking him why he doesn't believe in God. And Mifuni is starting to yell at him like, like, like he does in his, in his samurai move. And at one point he says, Yakabashi, which is Japanese for shut up. And it's a very, uh, it's a, it's an, it's a insulting thing to say Yakabashi to somebody. But of course, Marvin doesn't know what he's saying. And but they're they obviously know that they're angry at each other, and Marvin gets up, and he kicks over the fire pit, and he walks over to the other other end of this building, and he puts on a backpack, and he walks out, and Mufuni puts on a tie and a hat, and he's gotten in a uniform, and he walks off, and that's how Borman played that movie, and that's how I saw it when it was originally produced in 1969. And I, I was shocked when I saw the, the later version, and what happened was the producers just changed that ending. And when it opened in Britain and in Japan, 
it had the bombing, and they asked Borman about it, and he said, you know, it just doesn't work. It's kind of, they went through all of that effort, of that survival and getting there and, and surviving the thing, and it's very cynical, he said, for them just to kill them. And that's how they did it there. And, and he said, I hated it. And clearly, um, when you see the two films, the, the one with the bombing just makes no sense. Uh, the one with them walking off, they realize, you know what, we're still enemies. There's, you could hear bombing in the background. Uh, and Shackley says, uh, we don't know whether it's in their heads or it's actually out there, but there, there is... There is bombing or something going on in the background. But they obviously realize, oh, we're actually enemy. And then they separate and their friendship ends, which is, which is a very poignant and sad ending. But the, the bombing, to me, was pointless. Let me offer a thought on that, Mike. This, when they walked away from each other, the idea was that it was an imperfect relationship and an imperfect, um, you know, coming together. Uh, yeah. But they each learned things about the other culture. And I, that's got to be part of his, you know, intention in this movie. So when they walk away from each other and go back to their respective corners, go back to their respective cultures, they're going to take that experience, that lesson, cultural, you know, diversity lesson back to their respective countries. And, and, and so you, you have to wonder, you have to think, what is going to happen in the next chapter? If you kill them off, that becomes impossible. Well, and also, um, they don't kill each other. So they're enemies, and they're still at war, but they don't kill each other. Yeah, can I add, I, 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 I kept wondering how that movie played in Japan. You know, you're only 20 years after the after the end of World War II. You got two people who actually participated in World War II, and uh, and and it, for people who know the history of of the Pacific War, um, very few Japanese soldiers actually surrendered in World War II, and I'll bet very even fewer office Japanese officers surrendered. Um, and so, to for for the people for people in Japan to see these two interacting and reaching almost a kind of a friendship uh, seems to me would have would have been had a very would have been very impactful for a Japanese audience but I didn't see anything on Google of, about that but it would be very interesting to know that well I totally agree because MacArthur had come in and sort of Americanized westernized Japan and they were still involved in that process by 1968 and um, so I think they would have liked that that ending that movie you know, the, a movie in general, very, very much. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I guess my reaction um, is that uh, this was um, really a contribution to the conversation between the, you know, the U.S. and Japan. Um, and it was, a, uh, it was important in its own way, although it, apparently not all of American audiences liked it that much. But I would say the most uh, poignant moment in the movie, and I'd be interested in how you guys feel about the most poignant moment in the movie, is where um, Mufuni was subdued Lee Marvin. He had him on the ground. Uh, I think Lee Marvin was unconscious for some reason, and, um, and he pulled out Marvin's uh, knife, which was one of those, you know, 12-inch long, you know, it was a, a real killer knife. And and he had to decide what he was going to do because he could have killed them so easily, but he didn't. And it's that moment in the movie where you realize that there's some kind of fundamental human connection happening here. And it changed it because up to that point, they were enemies. At that point, there was something else happening. Do you agree? Or did you find some other moment in the movie that is, uh, you know, as as profound or more profound. Shackley? No, I, I agree. Uh, the, the other part, though, that I also liked a lot was when they get to the different, the, set, the second island uh, and, they, and they get into the building after they see that it's, they're the only people there, 
uh, Mapuni finds this cabinet that has uh, scissors, and uh, and he begins to to change himself uh, and by cutting off his beard, and then that leads to the change of clothes and, and his metamorphosis back to being a Japanese officer. And uh, I thought that was pretty interesting because you could see it coming. You know, once he once he saw those scissors and he started cutting his beard off, and uh, you could see that things were going to change. Yeah, this was only a temporary adventure, the temporary experience, and that when you when you got back to basics, they were still enemies. Mike, I kept thinking, there were, "Don't do it." <laughs> there were early on, at the very first scene or two on the movie, was a metaphor um, for uh, the entire movie, and that's uh, when they they meet on the beach. And Toshiri Mufuni's got this uh, stick that looks like a, uh, a sapphire sword. It's like bamboo. And, and Lee Marvin has his knife and a, and a branch, and they're facing off each other like they're in an arena. And what happens next is in their own minds. But the first thing that happens, Marvin runs over and he grabs Mifuni by the back and by the throat, and he stabs him in the back with a knife. And you think, my God, that's the end of the movie. And then they're back, then the next scene, they're back to facing off each other. And then Mifuni is on Marvin, and he beats him to a pulp down on the ground. Well, neither, neither thing happened. They just faced off, and then Marvin faded into the jungle. And so, they each saw themselves killing the other, but not doing it. And that, that's, to me, was a metaphor of, of the whole movie, that this thing eventually would become two friends, for, to, just for the sake of survival. Yeah, that was really a remarkable scene. And, and the Bournemouth uh, is playing with us. He's telling us what's in their minds, and we don't know it. We don't realize that yeah. it's only in their minds. Yeah, uh, that was kind of... <laughs> And that was yeah, a quick ending. Uh, Jay, there's um, there's an interesting discussion by Borman in his uh, interview. Uh, he had a very difficult time, although they became extremely good friends, Mufoni and Borman. But during the course of the filming, they had two scripts, one in Japanese and one in English. And someone who had written a script that they gave Mifuni that had him playing a different character. And and Borman said the character was a buffoon. And Borman wanted Buffoni to be this very structured, centered a guy who was uh, you know, not a buffoon. He he wanted him to be a really straight character. And every single day he had an argument with Mufuni over his characterizations. And he had to force Mufuni to be this character and not a buffoon. And, and he had to do it all through an interpreter. And the interpreter, when, the, when, when Borman was criticizing Mifuni, the interpreter said, it is not worth my life to do that. You know, I can't criticize Tishuri Mifuni. He says, you have to tell him this. Tell him he has to do this. And the guy, the interpreter, gets down on his knees, and he's almost praying to Mifuni, and he's telling him what Borman is telling him. And Mifuni hauls off and slaps him. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> but, uh, later on, um, Borman met with Kurosawa, who was the great Japanese director, and he directed all of Mufuni's samurai movies over the years, which are great. It, it, every single movie is a, is a thriller. Um, he asked him, how do you direct Mufuni? And Kurosawa said, you point, and he goes like an arrow. That's it. That's all you do. You just very different. He, he also he also asked uh, Kurosawa what 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 uh, did he have any suggestions as to how the movie should end? And he, 
he said, of course, I was complete straight face, thought about it and thought about it. And he said, they meet a girl. <laughs> That's Woman of the Dunes. <laughs> he, was, he was joking. Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. he, he was pulling his <laughs> thing. <laughs> Well, I, I have two questions I want to pose to you guys, uh, and uh, let, me, let me go with you, Shackley, first. What do we learn about, you, you know, uh, the, the principles of human nature, of the species from this movie, this deserted island, two, two enemies experiencing all the things in this movie? And, and, and there were so many things, so many, you know, little vignettes, little challenges uh, what do we learn about human nature? Well, I I I would say just that uh, there is a common humanity that we always share. We all share, and and the difference the the things that make us not want to share with each other and cause problems are cultural differences. Uh, but the common humanity underlies it all. If if you could just uh, uh, create some circumstances where it can come. It can it can surface and become dominant. Then people can get along fine, no matter what their cultures are. And I I think I think that's true. Captain Cook uh, believed that was as he traveled around into different civilizations and was able to do business with most places until until he ended up in on the Big Island and it didn't go so well. But for the most part, he did just fine. He went all over the unknown world and. And uh, and and it was because he just believed that we we have a common humanity no matter what our backgrounds and cultures are, and I I think that's you know. yeah. Even though sometimes we can't get all that close because the culture stands in the way, but you have to dig a little deeper to find the common humanity. Well, and the cultural differences, and if you if you don't think about that, the cultural differences. You go to a place like Japan. If you've never been to Japan. You don't know anything about Japan. You're going to be stunned by the cultural differences. Same thing in China. Um, but we're all people beneath it all. And uh, every place I've been in the world, I met lots of really nice local people. Uh, it was more when you got into talking to government officials that you know you had. <laughs> That's really an important point. Uh, Mike, I want to ask you a similar question. <clears throat> what from this movie do we learn about war? About World War II, but about war in general? Well, uh, Gorman was portraying the futility of war. I mean, it, it, it's not a pro-war uh, movie. So, and I'm not saying it's an anti-war, but it... But it uh, he was showing how futile it was, um, and it's 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 a remarkable story because it's hard to even imagine it happening. Although uh, I've seen references that it's based on a true story, but I've never been able to find that story because these these two characters um, they they didn't kill each other because they held they held back. Uh, they were sworn to kill each other. The, J uh, the Japanese, um, they, Bifuni was uh, sworn to the emperor to fight to the death. And uh, Lee Marvin pulls out a, a survival book, and he's reading it, and he, he says, well, what you do if you get on an island like this or in this situation, you kill the, the, the your, right, right, right. your enemy. And so they're being told by, by their cultures you know, sometimes culture either gets in the way or it actually helps. In this case, the culture was in the way because stripped of their culture and left to survival mode on this island, they resorted to, to looking beyond our skin color and our culture and where we came from and working together to the that they could only survive by working together. They could only build that raft and get across to that other island by working together. So in many ways, stripping culture out of there got them down to their basic uh, where they, they, were, they could work together just for the sake of survival. I, I think that's a remarkable tale. Yeah. Yeah, and, and as I said before, it really isn't a war movie. No, it's a movie. It's a movie where these guys are 
and they're thrown into it because of a war. But when you see them engage on the screen in the in the course of the movie, they're they're really they're enemies, but they're not at war. It's different. It 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 uh, the fact that um, that he walked that Mufuni walked off and wasn't. I could see why they 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 used the bomb ending in Japan because um, he was sworn to kill his enemy and he didn't and he walked off. So killing him off uh, saves that. Ah, it protects Mifuni from from criticism that that he didn't do the last gasp to right. either right. kill himself or kill his enemy. Yeah, that's B Bushido. You know, he should do that. It. Well, that reminds me of the guy on Guam. Do you remember that story? It's a Hawaii story. There was a, a Japanese soldier on Guam for, I don't know, decades after the war. He was still at war in the mountains of Guam. And finally, uh, they found him. Uh, but he had never given up. And he's a <laughs> Yes. Oh, yeah, about 27 years. Yeah. Uh, now, let me ask you guys the last question, and that is, how do you rate this movie on 1 to 10? And, you know, I, I advise you that many of our reviewers go over 10. So if you wish to go over 10, you can. Mike, you first. 11. <laughs> I, no, really. <laughs> As I said, I was in the Vietnam War when I watched this movie, and everybody on my ship was spellbound. And uh, I was, I just loved it. But I, I loved it from so many different Levels. Uh, I love the characters. I love, uh, of course, I love Toshiro Mifune and Lee Marvin for their other for their their other productions. But uh, the the visuals, you could, I mean, being from Hawaii, I felt like I was on a Hawaiian island without coconuts. Uh, so from from the characterizations, the visual, the 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 time that they were World War Two. Um, and that, that these two guys could overcome major diff difficulties culturally to survive, uh, to me, it just, it's over the top. It's over the top, but it's not soupy. At no point is it no. soupy. At no. no point is it, you know, straight Hollywood. You, you really get an idea of, of, of um, you know, of, of how they felt in, in, when faced with this, the reality of the situation. Uh, Shackley, what what do you uh, what do you rate the movie at? And you don't have you don't have to agree with Mike, by the way. No, I I give it a ten. I give it a ten. Uh, I thought it was a very good movie. Um, I kept a couple funny things. So you know, you think about when you watch the movies. I thought kept thinking, why did he lose his pistol? You know, naval aviators or in those days in World War II would carry a pistol, and you saw he threw the, the rounds into the fire at some point. And I thought, well, that's unsad. You shouldn't have lost that pistol. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. And, then, and, oh, and uh, oh, the other thing is they built that raft out of bamboo. I don't know if you've ever tried to cut bamboo, but that's, a, that's very difficult to cut big pieces of bamboo like that and they they didn't uh they sort of passed that uh without explaining or showing uh how they worked together to actually build that raft but that's a very minor thing yeah don't talk about bamboo uh, <clears throat> they improved the water catchment system by using bamboo right yeah. bamboo shoots and they they really solved that problem they solved a lot of problems and uh, there's a statement about that I, I suspect that without without um, having the raft, without caring about the raft, the two of them could have lived in that island for a long time and uh, because they had worked out the systems of giving nutrition and water and so forth. Anyway, we're, we're out of time. Shackley Raffetto, Judge Shackley Raffetto, Captain Shackley Raffetto, and, uh, and, and Mike Lilly, uh, General, Attorney General Mike Lilly, and Captain Mike Lilly, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a great discussion, a great review of a great movie. Aloha.
If you liked this show, why don't you give us a like or subscribe to our channel? Thanks so much.